All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the prayer meeting tonight on, on Wednesday night here at Bible Baptist Church. Let's take our hymn book, turn to number 460. Number 460, and we'll sing the first and last verses. You remain seated as we sing. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. On the last, what have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Hope y'all are doing all right. You doing okay? Good. JT is going to have to have a shoulder joint replacement. Remember him? He's not sure when the doctors are going to give him an appointment. Ed went to uh, the doctor, and they changed his uh, blood pressure medicine. And he's in kind of a dangerous shape with his heart, um, his blood pressure and all that. He could have a stroke or a heart attack. And uh, so remember Bill, please. Bill Wright is from the road. He and his daughter Debbie stopped by here today. And I got some money from him. I got to put an offer. Um, Bill is uh, 92 and his legs are giving out on him. Um, Tommy Baskin, his wife Rita is here today, first time back through the COVID. And uh, Tommy's legs are in really bad shape. He failed the other day and he's trying to get the doctor to do something to help him improve him. They did check the blood flow in him and told him he had enough blood flow in his legs. It wasn't that, but the muscles have atrophied or something. Tommy Nance has cancer and the He's finished all the chemo he can take other than those maintenance shots. And he is, the tumor did not shrink substantially, just some. Um, Debbie is not doing well today after her maintenance shot. She's having a rough time. And so Chris asked us to be sure and pray for her and his dad, Charles. Um, Carolyn. Uh, Wheeler is a Nance, Linda Brooks' sister. She was having a CT scan on her lungs. I hadn't heard an update. Uh, Frances Pegler is also Linda's sister who has COPD and a number of health issues. And her son, Ron, is the one who has the alpha-1 disease that he has to take uh, protein infusions. Uh, Tammy and Pat Munn have been on the prayer list forever. John Harden is 93 years old. He's in the hospital with COVID, and he is Stephanie Maddox's great uncle. And she asked prayer for his daughter because her his daughter's family was staying with him to take care of him, and they're the ones that exposed him to the COVID. So they're having a hard time with that. I think he was pretty much failing last report I got. Okay. May have improved. Lynn Ross went home instead of going to rehab, and she had rehab at home today, and Daryl said it went pretty good. Uh, Marie Britt is Sue Thomas's sister-in-law. She has uh, cirrhosis of the liver. She was having a lot of pain. She went and got checked out, and they told her it was cirrhosis. 
just a matter of months back, she had chemo and all and had cancer and they beat it back with the chemo, but it may have affected her liver. And her husband was away driving a truck in Michigan when the news came with what was wrong with her. So remember that family, please. Neely Marson is Pete Marson's nephew. Pete's name is Neely Marson, if y'all didn't know that. And he's a junior, that was his daddy's name. And his youngest brother, Doug, this is his twin sons, Scout and Neely. And those boys had rickets when they were very young. And Neely's just had to go through several surgeries to replace knee joints and things like that. And now he started having problem and they found he's got cancer in his kidney and in the lung. And Ron uh, Mabry, who's got the son that's got the long hair, looks like Clemson quarterback. His brother, Russ Mabry, has the same thing, cancer in the kidney and in, the, and in his lung. Um, they're going to test his to see if it's the same cancer. And if it's the same cancer, they're going to diagnose him as stage four. Rick Belcher is the young man who's... Uh, blind who fell and broke his hip had to have surgery and he was in and out of the icu twice and he's related to uh, diane huther that's her nephew and they went down to florida to sit with her dad for a week while the sister who's the mother to that boy could go to the hospital with her son and uh, uh, their granddaughter they got news on her I think she's 18, if I'm not mistaken. Her name's Taylor, and she's had problems with depression and bipolar, and it's her anxiety and depression have really acted up right now, and also Lisa. And so remember Jerry and Lisa also. Sam Stewart's mom is home under hospice, and they were going to start giving her morphine, morphine drops, so we expect it's going to She's going to pass pretty soon. Connie Rooks, David Ballard, Wayne Connor, Steve Williams all have cancer. Uh, my friend Shutt, whose name is uh, Billy Robinson, um, was in the hospital, several health issues. He's getting way up in age. Uh, the Templeton family, Dee and Tina, both have physical needs. Tina's sister has uh, several issues, and Dee's sister was in the hospital for the bone marrow transplant, and she got diagnosed with COVID again in the hospital. Um, Loretta and Paul Knapp, pray for both of them for their physical needs, and we're praying that, that Paul can save his foot and toes, you know, not have to have an amputation, but it hasn't gotten better up to now, but we all need to pray. Phyllis Hargett. Is uh, Ed Hargett's wife has uh, Parkinson's disease. Kathy Adamski is still wearing the boot on her foot that she hurt. Uh, Sue Clark, Sue Thomas, Jody's dad, Jerry Lark, and Tommy Cato all have serious back issues. Remember them, Miss Sue got some uh, uh, chiropractor work done or something here today. Okay, so pray this will work for her and she can avoid having surgery. I know she'd rather do that. Anybody else got somebody we didn't mention? Yes, ma'am. Carol? Okay. And um, then another neighbor, um, Justin is his name. He just underwent some brain surgery. He has Parkinson's. He's um, a young man of about in his 40s with an infant baby girl and a three year old girl. So please pray for Justin. He will have another, a second surgery on his brain for this Parkinson's. 
Okay. And then my sister Elena has four sons, and her oldest boy, who is 59 years old, just died not too long ago, and left a wife with um, two, uh, excuse me, three daughters, uh, my, my great nieces. Um, and his name is uh, Scotty, but please keep the Harper, H-A-R-P-E-R. Okay. Of course. Carol's still on the chemo pills. Yes, sir. Just for me, a part time job, two or three days a week. Billy needs a job. Part time. Okay. Nadia? The channel asked us to pray for her daughter, Salvation. Her name is Heather. She's 26 years old. Does she live with them? No. Okay. Remember Heather Cheryl's doing pretty good with that foot. She was here Sunday walking on it okay. Glad to see her getting out and about. Yes, sir. Sammy? Pray for my niece. Her name is Reshma. R-E-S-H-M-A. She's 27. She live in India? She, no, she's here in uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin. Okay. She has high potassium levels. Okay. Sometimes old folks have to have potassium added. You know, they're low potassium. Yeah, it's high potassium. But high potassium is dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah. So they were concerned. Okay. Reshma. Uh, too young for that, isn't she? Okay. We miss anybody else? Ira? Vera is flying to Missoula, Montana tonight. Visit friends. Okay. Missoula, Montana. I've heard of that before, but I have no idea where it is. <laughs> Montana's a a big state, but it's a cowboy state. It's um, it's got a few towns that movie stars have gone out and bought the whole places. You know, thousands of acres. One one actor owns twenty thousand acre ranch out there. You know, and uh, I guess they make some movies out there and they fall in love with it, so they buy it. <laughs> well, she's leaving one marina here in South Carolina and going to visit another marina who is uh, Ukrainian. In Montana. In Montana. Okay. Well, we hope she had a safe trip. Yes, sir. Right, this COVID has been there. Like these missionaries, people they need to go, you know, passports, you can't get anywhere they can. You know. Yeah. The Lord make a way to provide, like Brother Joe. A lot of the missions we support. A lot of these countries haven't opened up as much as we have here in the United States with their the missionaries. Some of them are getting back to having services, but the country's still locked down an awful lot. We do need to pray for all of them. All right, let's go to the Lord and ask him to intervene in these prayer requests. Give him our praise and thanks and pray that he will uh, bless the service here tonight. And, uh, Give us what we need through the word. Brother Jason, how about lead us in prayer, would you? God, heaven, we thank you for this day. Give the Lord, thank you for the beautiful word God. We um, thank you for our freedoms that we have, Lord, to be able to meet and gather here, God, and openly worship you here, Lord. And, uh, we just thank you for our health and well-being that we we're able to get here tonight, Lord. And uh, we do have so many things to be thankful for. Our homes, uh, Lord, you provide provisions for us every day. Our jobs, Lord, we have here, God. And, Lord, just constantly make provisions and you constantly provide for us, dear God. We want to give you thanks. We want to give you praise, Lord, because we know it's not we ourselves, God, but it's you that we want to take those things for granted. God, we do have been to us, dear God. And, uh, Lord, we do lift up our missionaries to you tonight, dear God. As has been mentioned, Lord, that uh, this uh, pandemic has touched them. Uh, many of them have uh, probably had their congregations uh, downsized, Lord, and have had. Uh, Issues with uh, offerings, Lord God. I pray we can just continue to support them, God. I, I 
and just pray that this church will continue to have a heart and a desire for missionaries and the work they do. We thank you, God, that we're able to be part of that, Lord. I and our giving the word self and spread the gospel as you would want us to do here. Yes. God, we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for this church for their heart to do that here, God. The people here, Lord, I just pray and bless them for their hearts to do that, God. And, uh, Lord, we do want to lift up the very long list, Lord, of um, prayer requests that were brought up tonight, dear God. We do remember JT and his shoulders, Lord, and pray you just uh, uh, give the doctors wisdom and guidance on how to deal with that. Lord, we do pray for Samuel and his family, God, and just pray to be with this young lady. Lord, well, remember the many that were mentioned for cancer, or fighting cancers, various forms of God, and this uh, terrible disease that, uh, Lord God, does show us that we are uh, human, we are frail, Lord, we do have a dependence on you, God, and this is just a reminder of how much we do need you and, and how much we do need your help and your support, God, and uh, Lord, I pray you just give these strengths that are working through that, God. And, uh, Lord, there are many mentioned of uh, physical wellness, Lord, outside of this, God, uh, some with broken bones, Lord. Do remember Paul Knapp tonight, God, and uh, just pray you be with him and Red and her foot, God. And do you remember Lynn Ross, Lord? And uh, dear God, we pray for those that are traveling. Uh, do dear God, we do remember specifically this one that was mentioned tonight for uh, salvation, God. Yes. Uh, Lord, I pray that we, all of us here will have a heart and a desire to do that, God. I pray that wherever we're at, with our neighbors or with our co-workers, God, that we'll have a good testimony with them, Lord, that our light will shine through us and, and point them to you, God. And, Lord, I don't want us to ever lose sight of that, God, and how important it is to, to be an example of you, go up God. We know we are ambassadors for you. We do represent you, and uh, God, in the time and uh, need, Lord, the Christians are often the ones that are turned to. And God, I pray that through these ailments and through these heartaches, God, that people will see, uh, Lord, that we have a relationship with you, and God will open up an opportunity and a path to provide the gospel to those who need it here, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray for the many. Uh, things that are going on here tonight, Lord, would be in the nursery or children's uh, classes, uh, master's club, dear Lord, the teens, God, the service here, Lord. Uh, Lord, we know your word tells us that you're with us, you're amongst us, God. And, uh, Lord, I pray you'll meet with us tonight, Lord. Do this, Pastor, dear God. I uh, pray for your hand of health upon him, dear God. Just continue to be with him as he leads and guides his church, Lord, in a difficult time. Uh, Lord, we do thank you for your son, Jesus, most of all tonight, dear God. We we thank you for taking our sins to the cross and now I'm there, God. The home that we have in heaven one day, Lord. We love you and thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Keep praying. Remember our friends, uh, Paul Cooper, who lives with his daughter up in uh, Virginia. And, um, his wife passed away a few months ago. Proverbs uh, 18, and we'll start with verse 14 tonight. We looked last week at uh, verse 1 through 13, and we pick up with verse 14 in chapter 18 of Proverbs. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear the heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. Man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. And today we pick up with verse 14, a wounded spirit is difficult to bear. Attitude can make a lot of difference in a person accomplishing things. We can keep a positive attitude and keep trying. We can often overcome obstacles and difficulties. Our focus should always be on God who can enable us to accomplish whatever he would have us to do. In the little book of Philippians chapter 4, in verse 11 through 13, Scripture says, Paul referring to uh, the fact that the church at Philippi supported him. He said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So having that kind of an attitude kept Paul going through all the difficulties he faced and all the hardships that he went through. 
Now, some people are given uh, bad news from doctors and they fall apart. Some people are given bad news and they say, well, that's what the doctors say, but God's in charge, not the doctors. And they determine that they're going to fight whatever they have and try to uh, get better. We've all heard stories of um, people like the the guys from the military who've been through all these terrible landmines over in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and their vehicles have been blown up, and so many of them have come back with brain disorders and with leg injuries and lost limbs, and some of them are determined that they're not going to just sit down and do nothing. They're going to work every day and try to get back where they can walk and be with their family and have some semblance of a life. And it's amazing the stories of those who have often overcome what the doctor said was not possible. And they are able to walk and they are able to function. And uh, they rejoice because of that. Some are haunted by what is called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that could happen to a girl who in her youth was abused in a home. She could suffer the, the continued emotional aspects of that in PTSD, or it could be somebody that was in a terrible war zone that was involved in killing and, and seeing men killed and that sort of thing. And they could uh, continue to have difficulties in their life from that. And uh, many determined to overcome and they seek help. Many of the veteran groups offer counseling and, and groups where they just get together and talk and share their stories and things of that nature to try to encourage men who've had those kind of hardships. When I first came back from Vietnam, getting saved a few years later really helped me deal with uh, having been in, in a war. Um, and I would seek to help anybody who suffers from that genuinely. Now, it's sad when some try to use something like that just to get money from the VA or money from other agencies or things of that nature. But um, some never live up to their potential because they're, uh, like verse 14 says, a wounded spirit. Um, we had uh, a neighbor who, uh, she came down with breast cancer, they removed her breasts. They did chemo, very hard chemo. And she was so sick, near unto death for so many months. And then finally she started doing better. And I saw her a few times out walking a little bit. And uh, she was starting to mend and, and get a little better. She had a young son who was just a few years old. And uh, they had a dog very similar to a dog we had back then. And, uh, and we talked a few times with them, her husband and her, and, and uh, really didn't get to know them all that well. But uh, um, we learned one day she was gone. And what had happened was the doctors had told her the cancer was back and it had aggressively spread. And it, she's going to have to go back on the heaviest chemo, just like what she was on before. And she just couldn't take that, and she took her life. And uh, your heart goes out to a family that goes through that, the husband and the child. He sold their home and moved. I'm not sure exactly, you know, if they moved in with family or something to help take care of the child. But it was heartbreaking. But she was a, a wounded spirit that could not overcome what she was having to live with. Um, some chemo is so harsh that uh, folks just can't take it. I remember Libby's dad, they tried him on a particular kind of chemo and it was just so devastating that he just told him to stop. He wasn't going to take it anymore. He just couldn't stand to, to take it. Uh, Ray Corn tried to take interferon when they found out he had uh, hepatitis in the liver and um, he uh, uh, couldn't take it. It, it was uh, battled as long as he could, but it didn't cure him, and it, it got so bad he finally had to come off of it. So people who face all kinds of things, unexpected deaths, divorce, 
depression for whatever reasons are often characterized as a wounded spirit and that is hard to bear. If our spirit helps us to be determined, we can sustain ourselves through all kinds of difficulties. And as Christians, we look to the Lord and say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Secondly, the heart of the prudent and the ear of the wise in verse 15. God created man with a desire to learn from the time uh, little kids say they, they want to learn how to do things. It's amazing to see kids that uh, learn how to, at a very young age, learn how to take their toys apart and put them back together. And I've seen kids do that at a young age. And I've thought a time or two, you know, I don't think I could put that back together, you know. And um, they, they develop a desire to learn and to do something. And God has instilled in man that desire. Um, God has revealed much in his word to help us to grow in the knowledge of God and of his word. And men are often driven to learn and to excel by learning. Um, the space program, conquering disease, um, all kinds of trades and crafts. The, the prudent word is um, our room, which is cunning or crafty. Well, the brain is never full. Even Dick Clark can still keep reading books all the time. You know, he's still learning at his age, you know, and uh, we can continue to learn until we die. And we can continue to learn the word of God until we die. And so we need to keep reading it. We'll learn all our lives but some determine to learn all they can in a particular thing. I've talked to people that know anything and everything there is to know about sports, uh, how to pitch a baseball or whatever. I've talked to people that know everything about automobiles, race cars, and all that sort of thing. If, if they had a car show at the uh, Motor Speedway in Charlotte this Saturday, Joey Mask would be there, I promise you. And he would be able to tell all kind of people all kind of things about those cars, you know. Um, some learn to study to cure disease. Some learn to study to invent things. Our little grandson, Benjamin, is determined he's going to invent things. And what he wants to invent is shoes that make you fly, you know, and, and, and he wants it to do like 10 different things or something, you know. He, he gets a little far out with some of those inventions he wants to come up with but he is a pretty smart kid, but it takes a lot to learn foreign languages. And most all of us have tried to learn a few words with a neighbor or a coworker and a greeting and some things of that nature. But, uh, you know, some of the translators of the King James Bible knew more than a dozen languages. And one fella, there were, he was recorded to know 18 languages and uh, several people have, uh, have studied multiple languages. It's hard for me to speak English and, and even, even uh, get anywhere close to speaking it properly and uh, without you know, adding other languages. But the mind can do it if we determine, if we set ourselves to it, if we ask God for help, we can accomplish many things. Verse 16, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Some people have a gift of music, ability to play music. I always say I can't play the radio. I, I don't have the ability to play any musical instrument. And uh, But some people learn to play the piano and then play before large crowds of people because they are gifted and can play very well. We've all heard of people who can play. You can give them a song they've never seen, and they can read through the music a little bit, and they can sit down at the piano and play that song just like they've known it all their life. Um, some play in command performances before kings and queens. I read that Benjamin Franklin was the 15th child of a family with 17 children. And he quit school when he was 10 years old to go to work for his father in a business making candles and soap. 
But in his spare time, while doing that, he taught himself Latin, French, Italian, and Spanish. He became a printer and uh, printed uh, on the Gutenberg Press. And he became a writer, his little Richard Almanac and quotes went around the world. He founded a newspaper and a magazine. And by the time he was 42 years old, he had become rich and he left business to devote his life to the government and to, um, to serving his country. He wrote electricity. We've all seen the pictures of him with the kite, with the key on the string, you know, getting struck by lightning. But he wrote books about electricity were translated into numerous languages. He was the first person to identify the positive and negative poles in electricity. He invented the Franklin stove that has a hot air radiator on it. And uh, at 78, he invented bifocals. I'm still wearing them. And uh, he founded a school that became the University of Pennsylvania. Now, this man was um, from a big family, so they were not wealthy. And he had very little education when he was young. But he overcame all these obstacles. And he had certainly the gift that in the political realm, he was before kings and potentates and presidents of countries. And... Um, was highly used as an American. Verse 17 through 19. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. The lot causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like bars of a castle. We're usually first in our own cause, our ideas, what we think, how we want to do something. Salesmen are certainly first in their cause. They believe the product they're selling is the best on the market and it's the best priced and all that sort of thing. If you don't believe that, just ask one and he'll be glad to tell you that. Uh, we support uh, dozens of missionaries and children's homes and orphanages and the Palmetto Women's Center and men's rehab and foreign church planters. And we have um, the Palmetto Ladies Ministry does a good job with uh, providing an alternative to abortion. And the uh, Visions Baptist Missions is a newer mission board that was started by a missionary who'd been on the field. He came back, started the mission board, and he, and he started a school to train young men who want to be missionaries. And so both of these are doing a good work, and we're happy to support both of them. The only problem I have is both of those organizations think they're the only mission that we should support. They believe we should give everything to them and totally support them and give them all of the extra money we can possibly come up with because every need they have is the most important need of all missionaries. And I keep telling them, look, we support our missionaries in a balanced way. We're not going to do for you what we don't do for all the others. And we don't single out one or two and try to support them with a lot of money and then just give a little bit to everybody else. And so um, they fit right in with this passage of scripture where um, they believe that they're first in their own cause. They seem just in doing that, but the neighbor must be me that comes along to tell them differently and uh, to help them out. Verse 18, the lot is cast. The lot is basically just a vote, to have a ballot, to have a vote. And that stops a lot of diversity uh, and difficulty contentions if, um, if we can... Um, get a majority vote on something, then there's really no reason to have difficulty in it. Um, it could be a flip of a coin. It could be a vote. And David, when he was, uh, before he became the king, 
he fought many battles with the uh, Philistines and uh, and even you know running from Saul and um, sought the priest at one point to give him the ephod and he put on the ephod and inside the ephod they had two uh, stones and they believed was a white stone and a black stone and they would put the stones in without knowing. And then he would reach in and he would pray and ask God and he would take out a stone. And if it was the white stone, it meant God was telling him yes. And if it was the black stone, it meant no. And these were called Urim and Thummim. And that uh, deals with the um, aspect of lights, like the high priest stones of many colors that he wore in his garment. Um, the lights, and then Thummim is perfections. And so these were part in the mind of God that he gave to the high priest to wear that were a, a clear indication that this man had something that every person didn't have in his garment. And it was something that God would use in, in leading him for the nation. Uh, the disciples held a, a vote uh, when they wanted to replace Judas from being a disciple. In the early part of Acts, they took a vote and, and cast lots, and they decided on one particular man to be the replacement. In a football game, they flip a coin and decide who's going to kick off, and the one that's going to kick off gets to determine which goal they're going to defend, and that sort of keeps them from arguing over all of that. It removes the contention by voting. And a vote is a good thing to do. And um, we have a lot of votes in church business. Verse 19, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. We've all known somebody who got terribly offended in a family or a church and they wouldn't speak to other people, and they were truly harder to be won back than a walled city would be to conquer. Jacob and Esau fell out over their differences as brothers, and they were separated for many years. But when Jacob finally was going to bring his family and return to his homeland, uh, he met Esau along the way. And they had a, a pretty good, um, it wasn't the greatest, but they'd been apart for a long time. Families, their own way of doing things, their own place to live. And so they didn't reunite and live next door to each other as brothers or anything, but they didn't continue to have terrible contentions among them. <clears throat> In anger, people set up um, bars, locking out other people. Uh, <laughs> Not too long after we moved out to where we live now to help out my mom and dad, and we set up a double wide mobile home out there in the country on in pasture land. And the neighbor that lived next door to us back then, uh, she was a very private person, and she didn't want to have any neighbors. She didn't want to meet people. She didn't want to talk to anybody. And uh, they had a. Uh, a, a fence around their property and down at the very bottom of our road there was a there's a pond off to the right that belonged to them and um, my other neighbor that lives quite a distance away that's related to Mr. Pete that's what's wrong with him he's related to Pete he uh he was jumping that fence and going fishing in their pond and she got it in her head that it must have been me doing that and so she hung a sign on that fence about you church hypocrites, stay off my property, you know, and all that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> and I thought, boy, that uh, that's tough. And um, she she had bars around her. She didn't want to let anybody in. And uh, I did go visit her when she was in the hospital with cancer, and she acted pretty civil toward me at that point in time. But uh I don't think she cared much for any anybody. It wasn't just me. 
Divorce is a creator of enemies. Not too many people have divorced and remained friends and had um, conciliatory visits with the children and all that sort of thing. Too often it, it really divides up people. I've even seen it divide churches because of uh, divorces of people in a church and, and families in the church, and it can cause a, a split in a church. I had a preacher friend that um, used to pastor up in Virginia, uh, West Virginia, and he uh, pastored a church that was an older church, and the treasurer of that church had about 15 relatives that were members of the church. And one day he went into the bank, and the bank lady, vice president, called him over, and he went over to her desk and said, I got to talk to you privately. And she told him that the treasurer had been stealing money from the church's accounts. And he had actually paid for his son's college and all this sort of thing out of the church accounts. And so he went back and met with the deacons and all that sort of thing and talked to him about what we're going to do about this, you know. And he ended up having to leave the church because they wanted to fire him rather than have all these people turn against their relative who stole the money. Now, that's how silly and contentious that people can become to um, drive a, a wedge between people through their differences. And uh, God help us to, to be just and right and also kind when we disagree with folks. Verse 20 through 24, learning to be satisfied or content. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. The poor useth entreaties, but the rich answereth roughly. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now we have to learn to live with the consequences of our actions. And that includes with the consequences of our words, of what we say. Um, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If a man's heart's good, he should speak good things. But if a man's heart is evil, he's going to speak evil things. Sometimes men's words are bitter or untrue or slanderous. And people who give those will have to live with the outcome. Other men's words edify and build up and console. And those people are blessed from the benefit of helping other people. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We know James chapter 3 deals with the tongue and it can uh, bless or it can start a fire. And... Um, God help us to use our tongues wisely and to restrain our emotions and immediate comebacks when people hurt us. We're admonished to control our tongue. It's much harder to tame than a wild beast. I wish my teeth could work on an automatic scale where when I get ready to say something that's wrong, that my teeth would just drop down, you know, and keep my tongue from working because it's hard to call something back after it's been said. We can say, I'm sorry. We can apologize, but it'd be a whole lot better if we just waited and not said it at all to begin with. Um, verse 21 ends up with the old adage of the truth of God that we reap what we sow. And as we do things, we will they will return to us if we blurt out in anger, we should be very quick to apologize and confess to God that we have sinned and confess to our friend that we have sinned. Let us not blame our actions on others. If I get mad and say something harmful, I can't go to God and say, Lord, you know, it was only because old so-and-so did this or that to me that I said what I did. That's not confession. To confess our sins is to say the same thing about them that God would say. And I'm responsible for what I say and what I do. You might make me mad, but I'm responsible for how I respond. 
And it's important that we learn to stay in control and confess to God our sins and apologize in a sincere way. Apologize to God if we fail to restrain our tongue. Uh, we need to ask God continuously to help us to control our emotions, our temper, and our desires, and restrain our tongue and use it for prayer and praise and words that edify and build up others. Verse 22, God created marriage because it was not good for Adam to be alone. God saw right away it's not good for man to be alone, so he made woman and he joined the two of them together in marriage. He gave them children. Children are called the heritage of the Lord in the Psalms, and that means they're a gift of God. God instituted the home and the marriage. God instituted civil government, and God instituted the local church. All of these things God started and founded for us to be a blessing and a help to us. Verse 23, the poor useth entreaties, but the rich answereth roughly. Now the rich shouldn't answer roughly, but they often do. Because the rich are not dependent upon the poor, the poor are dependent upon the rich. A poor man will, will, will try to smooth the wealthy because he's dependent upon them. They're his uh, landlord or they pay his paycheck. And he's dependent upon them, and so they, they are careful what they would say to him or about him. But the wealthy can allow himself to be rude and curt with the poor because he's not dependent upon them. But that's certainly not how a Christian should act, whether he's rich or poor. In James chapter 2 and verse 2 through 8, James wrote to the brethren, If there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves? and are become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. So God help us as Christians to have that uh, rise above the norm of how people act and let the Spirit of God lead us to act on the basis of love, whether a person be rich or poor. You know, I learned a long time ago as a pastor, poor people need to be saved and rich people need to be saved too. And when we look at either one of them, we don't need to see what kind of car they drive or what kind of house they live in or what kind of clothing they wear. We just need to see them as possibly lost souls that need to be saved. And we need to be sincere with them in that vein. In verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Now we saw friendship in Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend is a close companion, someone we have a lot in common with. We're not to be a friend to the world, the unsaved world in which we live. We meet a new person, we're to show ourselves friendly. The prodigal lost his newfound friends when he ran out of money because he was buying them and their attention with his inheritance. Joseph was a true friend to his family and to the nation of Egypt and to the nation of and to all he met along the way. He was a friend to Potiphar, whose wife tried to get him to commit adultery with her, and he wouldn't do that 
even to the point that he went to prison because of her lying about him. In the jail, he met other prisoners, and he was a friend to them and sought God for answers to their dreams. To Pharaoh, he was a friend to him. He told him what his dreams meant. And then Pharaoh said, who better than you do we have that we can put over all this business for the nation of Egypt? And Joseph rose in power to be second in the land of all Egypt. And then when his brothers came down to buy corn, boy, he could have got even with them then. They sold him into slavery. They hid him in a pit. They told his father he was dead. They took his coat of many colors his father had given him and dipped it in the animal's blood and showed it to his father and all these things these guys had done. But what Joseph did was give them their money back in their sacks and sell them corn. And when they ran out and came back again, Joseph just couldn't stand it. He stole alone with them. And he said, I'm Joseph. Boy, they got scared then. They thought here he is sitting on the throne in Egypt. He can take our lives that quick. So much so they thought it would even happen after their father's death. They figured, now our dad's gone. He's, he's only kept us alive and been good to us because daddy was still living. Now daddy's gone, and we better watch out. Joseph's going to get us. And they went and laid down before him and said, we are your servants. And Joseph said, what you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph saw above the trials and tests he went through God was working a plan to save Egypt and Israel and all his family. And Joseph was not satisfied to stay in Egypt. He said, God is going to come as he promised in his word. And you're going to leave this land and go back to Canaan. And when you do, take my bones with you. I don't want to stay here in this place. And they did. They took his bones with them as they went back to Canaan. I want to be that kind of friend to people, help people, encourage people, point them to God, try to show them the way. And I believe God will bless us if we'll do that. Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of your people in being here in this midweek service. They've worked all week. They're tired. They've labored. Uh, we've had the adversity of the, the climate. We've had the adversity of the pandemic. We've had the our, our political system. So, Lord, we call upon you because we know you're all powerful and you love us and you've promised to bless us if we will serve you and live for you and put Christ first. So help us to do those with confidence tonight and bless these families and protect them as they travel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Miss Diane will play through a verse. If you need prayer, counsel, come, we'll help you. All right, Mr. Pete, hear me? Dismiss us in prayer, please. Thank you that we can come assemble together today to hear your word preached. We pray in your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. Help us to uh, be obedient to your word. We remember those that are sick. We pray for your hand upon them. We pray that you bless the caregivers. We pray for our missionaries that you give up souls for your church and help us to be faithful, praying and giving that they can stay on the field and do what they need to do. Yes. And all do. We pray for our nation, God, and direct our leaders, give them wisdom and government. Now watch over us and take care of us as we go home and give us uh, wisdom in every decision we make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you.